Good morning, everyone. How are you? Well, yeah, so great to be with all of you. If we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Jeff, and I am one of the leaders here at the church. And we're going to continue um, our series, a, a spiritual practice that we call prayer. There are many spiritual practices that we as Christians should probably involve our lives around or, or revolve our lives around, I should say. Um, prayer is one of them. Bible reading would be another. I think... Um, quietness before the Lord is an important thing. I think Bible study, I think going to church, all those things are spiritual disciplines or practices that we can use in our life to grow in our understanding of who God is, our understanding of who we are and what God has called us to. And so we started a series a couple of weeks ago on prayer. And I want to continue that. In fact, uh, this last week, I met with our staff. I want, to, I want to increase our prayer series one week. We're going to go five weeks instead of four. I'm, I'm learning a ton of stuff as we are uh, reading about prayer and studying about prayer. So I think it's going to be good. One of the things that we had to remind ourselves, though, is that prayer is super important. It would not shock anyone here, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, that prayer should be a part of our lives. Yes? Raise your hand if you think it should be. Yes. And we, we all admitted a couple weeks ago that we don't do it as much as we should, right? And we wish we did it more or whatever, and we wish we prayed more honestly and all those things. And that's okay, but the whole thrust thus far in this um, series has been that prayer is important to us, and it's powerful. We've been hanging on to this um, psalm, Psalm 34, 17, I think, and it just says this, that the prayers of the righteous are heard, right? When, when a righteous man prays, God hears them and he delivers them. So we know that God's paying attention, right? And when we pray, God hears us and he can help us. And we know our righteousness, righteousness is not found in anything that we do, but in fact, the work that Jesus has done for us. So we go to God in prayer. It's important and it's powerful and it helps us. And I want to share a story in Luke chapter 11 today. So if you have your Bible with you, we're going to be in Luke chapter 11. I'm going to be reading a parable that Jesus shared with his disciples. As you're turning to Luke 11, I'm going to share a real quick verse or two out of James. James is the brother of Jesus. And James is closing a letter that he wrote to Christians. And he's talking about faithfulness in prayer. He's talking about the power of faithful prayer or praying, and he says these words in James chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. And he says, Elijah, and you don't need to know who Elijah was, but the listeners did. They knew who Elijah was. This is Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he what? He prayed. He prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Verse 18, then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So there's this crazy story in the Old Testament where God used a man, Elijah, to do this miracle thing. And so Elijah prayed, and for three and a half years, there was a drought. And the people were like wondering, what's going on? And all of a sudden, Elijah prayed again, and it started to rain. And all of a sudden, all the fruit started to come back to the land. And, and James is pointing to this reality that Elijah was not some supernatural being. He's not angelic. He was a man with a nature like ours. Hear me when I say this, that the prayer that God used to stop the heavens of rain for three and a half years was, was given by a man named Elijah who's just like you and me. And the encouragement for that would be that God is using people, normal people like, well, I don't know how normal all of you are. I'm looking at you, Mike. I don't know how normal everyone is, but, but God uses people like us to do incredible things. John Calvin, you don't need to know who he is, but know this. He's got a lot to say about predestination and God's sovereignty. If you know, if you know anything about John Calvin, that's a lot of his work, right? Anyways, he made this remarkable statement about prayer based on those passages in James chapter 5 about Elijah. And look what John Calvin says. He says, it was a notable event for God to put heavens in some sense under the control of Elijah's prayers and to be obedient to his requests. What? I didn't say it, John Calvin said it. By his prayers, Elijah kept heaven shut for three years and a half, and then he opened it. And he made it suddenly pour with great rain, from which we may see the miraculous power of prayer. Tim Keller writes this, it is, parts, it is part of God's goodness and appointment that he allows the world to be susceptible to our prayers. I want you to hear that. That Elijah was just like us, and he prayed and God did something. Calvin's word says that God was somehow obedient to his prayers. Uh, don't get weird on me. But something was happening there. And Keller says that it's this beautiful 
part of God's goodness, that he allows our prayers and actions to be responsible with that stuff. So the question that we wrestle with is how does God maintain control over history, which I think God is sovereign and has control over all things, and yet still allows our prayers and our actions to be responsible within history? This is the question I'm wrestling with. If we believed God to be in charge of everything, right, we could make the mistake of somehow believing that our actions don't matter and we fall into this sort of fatalistic ideology that doesn't matter what we do, God's going to do what he wanted to do anyways, and we have this sort of discouraged passivity in our lives. If God's in charge, he's going to do it, doesn't matter what I do. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. On the other side, if we believe that our actions, and this is a scary thought, that if our actions in in fact change God's plans, like if I pray and can actually change God, if I prayed and God would do something that I asked him to do, it would maybe paralyze me with fear because I don't always pray for the right things. Anyone? Especially at Walmart. Anyone? (laughs) Especially at the DMV. Anyone? Like if I could call down mushroom clouds from heaven, I would do that. Right? Right? But somewhere in between the two of God's sovereignty, that he is in charge of everything, and his willingness to allow our prayers to bend history, we live. We live in the tension between those two. It appears that both of those are, in fact, true. We have the greatest incentive for diligent effort and prayer. Now, who, by show of hands, is encouraged now? Okay. I thought it was going to go better than that. Anyways. It's all good. I'm super encouraged about it. Keller Keller writes this again. He says, it is a tremendous truth that God deigns to hear prayer. It just means he bows to hear the prayer. And he allows the world to be in some sense under the control of the power of prayer. This power is, uh, prayer is uh, powerful and effective. And hear me, it's not just Christians who believe this. I think the most recent study I read that says one in five about 18%, one in five agnostics pray. Right? These are people who don't believe that there is a God, but they don't know, maybe just in case, I'll throw a prayer up when things get really rough. Maybe some of you are in the room. Welcome, we're glad you're here. Same study said that one in 10 atheists, people who believe there is no God at all, oftentimes when things get really tough in their lives, they will pray as well. So it's not just Christians who believe in the power of prayer, but even non-believers believe in the power of prayer as well. In fact, Austin Phelps, he writes a book on prayer, and he tells this story that took place in the 7th century. Uh, You may have heard it before, but I'll repeat it if you haven't. He tells of the story of this king, Ethelfrith. He's a pagan Saxon king of Northumbria, and he is um, invading into Wales at the time. He's trying to take over basically what is now modern-day England. And he invaded Wales and was about to spread out and give battle over them. And the Welsh at this time, they were Christians, Okay, so the, the, the nation of Wales is already Christian, and as they're getting ready to do battle, Ethelfrith noticed that the, um, the army of his opponents, the Welsh army, was coming out before him, and he noticed over to the side a whole host of unarmed men, and he wondered who these people were, so he asked, he says, who are these people? And he was told that they were the Christian monks of Bangor, that they'd come out to pray that God would protect them, and God would deliver you know, the Wales army, that the Welsh army would do better in battle. Um, Scholars disagree, historians disagree how many monks were actually out praying. Some say 200, some say up to 1,200. We don't know that for sure. But one thing we do know for sure is what happened next. This King Ethelfrith looked to his commander and captain of his army. He says, if those are Christian monks praying for their army, kill them first, he said. So he believed in the power of prayer. This last week, um, I had a, an encounter with God through prayer that I wanted to share with you, and I've been holding on to it for a few days, and I'm so excited. I hope I can get it out. I have a friend of mine, I haven't seen him in a while, and I texted him. You ever text a friend you haven't seen in a while, and they don't respond to you? Right? That's typically me, because I'm a terrible texter. Raise your hand if I've never responded to your text in the room. I love all of you. Yes, I love all of you. I'm a terrible texter, but I texted my friend, and I'm like, hey, man, just thinking about you. Give me a call sometime, and nothing, nothing from him, and I would see him maybe once or twice a year, so I was a little upset, so I went for a run the other day from the office, and I usually run down Water Street, and then I go down West Main all the way out to Millican, pick up Fairview Park, and come back, and when I run, I run by my friend's house, and every once in a while, he'll be outside walking his dog or getting in his car or something, and I thought to myself, I've got his wrong number or something. I must have, he changed his phone number. I've texted him. He won't text me back because surely he would text me back, right? Because I'm likable. Say yes and amen. I'm likable. 
help me a little bit. Yes. But he hasn't texted me back. So I go for a run, and I'm not kidding you. I turn a corner onto West Main Street, and I'm running. I said, and I say these words, Lord, I pray that my friend would be outside today, and I would see him because I want to tell him I've been thinking about him. I don't get two blocks down the road, and my friend is not outside in his yard walking his dog or getting in his car. He's actually walking down the sidewalk towards me. And I, I giggled and I smiled as I ran up next to him. And I told him I've been trying to get a hold of him. And he says, yeah, yeah, I got your text. I just didn't respond. I'm like, you're a jerk. It's fine. It's fine. But then I told him, but I was praying that God would bring you to me today. And he smiled. And we connected. Now, I just share that story with you to tell you that in this whole series on prayer, I've, had, I've been reinvigorated to pray again. For like the little things. Did it matter to God that I see my friend I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but it mattered to me. And when I prayed, God, I don't know, did this thing. Charles Spurgeon used to say this, when I don't pray, coincidences don't happen. And when I pray, coincidences happen. You can chalk that up for coincidence. I don't give a rip. I know that I prayed that I would see my friend and he was there. I also know I've prayed for greater things than that. And God hasn't answered them at all. I've prayed for bigger things than that. <laughs> I've prayed for more. I've prayed for, I mean, you, like, Lord, should we buy this house or not? Should we, like, do this or not? Like, big things. And God's, like, silent in the whole deal. And that's what the question I want to answer today. What do we do when, when we pray to God and he doesn't seem to answer our prayers? Jesus seems to preemptively answer that question that we would have in Luke chapter 11. Jesus, if you remember, he gives the disciples a way to pray. In Matthew chapter 6, we read the Lord's Prayer last week, and we won't do that again. But in Luke chapter 11 is another prayer called the Lord's Prayer. It's again Jesus giving instruction to his disciples. The disciples that came to him says, Jesus, would you teach us to pray like John teaches his disciples? And so Jesus is like, sure, this is how you pray. And I'm going to read this out of Luke chapter 11, starting here in verse 2. And Jesus says to them, well, when you pray, right, this sounds like the Lord's Prayer, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we for ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Again, this is the abridged version of the Lord's Prayer in Luke. The bigger version is Matthew chapter 6. And Jesus gives instructions to his disciples on how to pray. It's, um, it's a template of sorts. We talked last week that these are, we don't just recite the Lord's Prayer just as meaningless words, thinking that somehow it's going to twist God's arm to do something for us. But we, we use the template of the Lord's Prayer to pray to him. We go to him with real prayers. So anyways, and then after he teaches them how to pray, he tells them a parable. In the next few verses, Jesus teaches a parable. Now, a parable, if you don't know, is just a simple story to, that is used to teach some moral or spiritual lesson. And so Jesus teaches his disciples, right after teaching them how to pray, this parable. And let's read it together, starting here in verse 5. And Jesus said to them, Which of you who has a friend, right, will go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, don't bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. He basically doesn't want to be bothered, right? Verse 8, but I tell you, this is Jesus saying, I tell you this, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, say that word with me, impudence. That was terrible. You guys are really, really bad impudence. Yes, I've never heard it either. We'll talk about that later. Because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. If we may, I'd like to pray right here. Would you bow with me? Lord, help us to understand this. Help us to hear these words afresh and new and to be encouraged, much like the original disciples were when you taught it to them. God, we thank you 
Holy Spirit, open our eyes, open our ears, let us understand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in, in this parable, there are three characters. There's this traveling person, right? This person just showed up. And then we've got the, the needy neighbor that needs some loaves of bread. And then we've got the sleepy neighbor. And to give some understanding and context to the story, it seems unusual maybe an hour day that a visitor would show up at midnight, sort of unannounced, and all of a sudden I need to set out some food for them. But it's not uncommon in Jesus' day. Okay, so because of the place that they lived in Palestine, Jesus' listeners would have understood this, that many people travel oftentimes at night just to avoid the heat of the day. And so when the sun starts to set, they'll start to make their way to other towns. And sometimes they get held up for whatever reason. The donkey gets a flat. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know what happens, right? Someone's got to go to the potty again. Couldn't you do that before we leave, Jimmy or Jebediah? I have no idea. So anyways, but they get to the house late. And this is pre-cell phones, so you can't get a hold. You just come knocking at your friend's door and at midnight. So that's why Jesus says they showed up at midnight. This is not uncommon. Be uncommon to us, but not to them. And also in this culture, there was a huge, um, uh, I don't know what I'm looking for, but people were very hospitable is what I'm trying to say. And, and you tried to be hospitable. In fact, you guys remember the story in the Old Testament where they talk about uh, if, if you're, if you're uh, hosting someone, you should always host them well because they might be angels that you're hosting. Has anyone ever heard this? So they really believe this, that when people come, that they should be hospitable as possible because it's quite possible you're hosting a divine being of some sort. So whenever people came, you just rolled out the red carpet, you, you, you got the, the omelet bar out, and you just made a bunch of food for them. You put food up for them. didn't matter if it's midnight or not. You know what I'm saying here? And there's this sort of honor-shame culture that they lived in. And if you didn't do those things, that you could be shamed in your community because you weren't a good host. And so this is sort of the context of this story. So a traveler shows up to a friend's house and just, boom, barges in at midnight. And he realizes, I don't have any food to offer him. What do I do? I've got to be a good host. So he goes to his neighbor who's asleep. And pounds and pounds and pounds on the door and says, give me something so that I don't lose face. Give me something so that I'm not shamed because I don't have any food for this traveler friend of mine. Please give me something. And the sleepy neighbor says probably what you would say, 100% what I would say, no. <laughs> like, I'm in bed. Anyone? Anyone? Yes, I'm in bed. I don't want to get up and do this. I get bothered if my dog has to go potty in the middle of the night. Anyone? Right? That's what I'm talking about. Okay, here we go. So I don't want to get up in the middle of the night. And so he says, no. And yet Jesus says, again, after just teaching them on prayer, he says, but the friend, listen, but he will give something. He will give something, and he won't do so because of his friendship to you, but he will do so because of his, verse 8, impudence. Remember that word, impudence. I did not know what impudence meant. I graduated from college, just we didn't study this. I'm just telling you. So I wanted to look up what impudence meant, and I'll read it to you. Impudent means to be rude, to not show respect, especially to someone who is older or in a more important position. So here's what Jesus is saying. Because of his neighbor's rudeness, his unwillingness to go back home and deal with it on his own, he just keeps pounding on the door and knocking on the door. Because of that, the, the sleepy neighbor will relent and give him the loaves. Now, the ESV, the translation that I read when I'm studying and preaching, um, uses the word impudence. Many of you might have the KJV, King James Version. It uses the word importunity, an even stranger word, I'm just telling you. <laughs> Sounds like the King James, doesn't it? Doesn't it? So importunity, importunity just means this, persistence, especially to the point of annoyance, right? This is what our kids do to us sometimes. Synonyms to importunity would be claim, to demand, to give an ultimatum. So hear what Jesus is saying. Because of his demand that his sleepy neighbor get up and give him something, that's why he will do it. The New King James Version uses the word persistence. Ah, I like that word. That one I understand a little bit. Persistence. The New Living Translation says if he keeps knocking long enough, the neighbor will open the door. The NASB says this. Because of the neighbor's shamelessness, 
He's not ashamed to sit there and knock on the door. I like that word even more. And the NIV, many of you have the NIV, says this, that because of the neighbor's shameless audacity. Now, I give you all of those different translations for this reason, to just show to you that translators have um, maybe struggled is the wrong word here, but they have tried to best give us a word that will help us interpret what's happening. It's, it's a struggle for us because Jesus is telling us this story about the persistent need for prayer, right? He just told his disciples how to pray, and it says, it's just like a neighbor who wants food and da, 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 knocks, knocks, knocks. He goes, that's what our prayer should look like. But the, the hard thing for us to follow here is that somehow we can be rude to God, that if we just annoy God enough, he'll give us what we're asking for. That's why I like the word persistence, and I even like the other word shameless a little better. Because of the neighbor's shamelessness, God will the neighbor will do something for him. When I think of God in, in our lives, um, I'm, I'm reminded of how much shame and guilt that I used to carry before I knew who Jesus was. Okay, I became a Christian late in life. I was 26 years old before I became a Christian, and I lived a long and hard life. I used to say this, that the wake of debauchery followed me everywhere I went. And I knew I was making bad decisions, and I knew I was hurting people, but I somehow just couldn't bring myself to stop doing it. Anyone? Anyone? I just couldn't stop. And I carried with me some shame and some guilt over that. And then when I came to know the Lord, I carried all of that shame and guilt to him. And he introduced me to Jesus. And Jesus... With, when, I, when I learned what he did on the cross for me, when I, when I learned what he did for all of my sins, that he atoned for my sins on the cross, the Bible tells us that there is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood, that Jesus was the sacrifice given. I don't want to go too preachy on this, but just know this. In that moment, all of a sudden, the shame that I carried left, and I now stood before God shameless. Anyone? Shameless. And so when the NIV uses that, that phrase, shameless audacity. I sense that now. When I stand before God and I ask him for something, I'm standing before him shameless. Why? Because Jesus has done something for me that I couldn't do on my own. And so now when I stand before God and ask, I can ask because of that. But it still makes us feel like God is somehow relenting to our asking, that somehow he's unloving and hard and doesn't want to do this, but because of our shameless audacity, because of our persistence, because of our impudence or whatever, God somehow goes, fine, just take it and get out of here, would you? Is that how God sounds like in your head too? <laughs> Sometimes it feels that way. May, may I remind you that every metaphor or every parallel or whatever falls apart at some point. That Jesus is giving this parable as an example for persistent prayer. He's not trying to say that God is the sleepy neighbor. Charlie Dates, he's a pastor up in Chicago. He preached a sermon on this passage that I listened to and loved. And I'm going to steal some of his stuff right now. I'm just saying. So he said this about the sleepy neighbor. The sleepy neighbor is not for us to be a picture of who God is, but rather is to be the antithesis of who God is. Follow with me. Charlie Date says that the sleepy neighbor is asleep and doesn't want to be bothered. But the Bible tells us that God never sleeps, Right? That God never sleeps, that he's always awake. The sleepy neighbor doesn't want to be bothered or inconvenienced, but God is a loving father who attends to every need of his children. The sleepy neighbor appears to show no compassion for his neighbor's situation, but God is, and if he's anything, he is compassion. That he is kindness and love and compassion towards us. The sleepy neighbor angrily relents due to the persistent knocking and asking, and yet God is not angry with us, his children. God has anger. It's a righteous anger, and it's typically levied against sin, debauchery, wickedness, unrighteousness, all those things. But in Christ Jesus, God is not angry with us. Oh, my goodness. Would you hear that today? God is not angry with you because of Jesus. (laughs) 
He doesn't have to just relent because of your unwillingness to, to stop asking. He lovingly has compassion and, and will answer prayers on that request. The sleepy neighbor does not want to save the needy neighbor from embarrassment and ridicule. As this person is surely going to be ashamed by his inability to provide food and to be a good host. But God's greatest desire is to save us, to save us from the ridicule of our shame and our sin and of everything that we've ever done wrong. God is willing to step in the the gap there and to help us with that. So Charlie, Pastor Charlie helps us see that the story here is not really a picture of who God is, but sometimes the opposite of who God is. But the, the whole parable, hear me when I say this, the purpose of this whole parable is Jesus is saying, persist, persist. There's a hundred reasons why you should continue asking. There's a hundred and one reasons why, but sometimes we don't. Why? Why don't we continue to ask? We, left, we are left asking this question, why does God sometimes delay when answering our prayers? Why does he delay? Or better yet, why is Jesus telling his disciples to be persistent? Why is that such an important thing? And um, there's a hundred reasons probably why. I, I'm going to just give you a couple. Um, we'll come back to prayer over the next couple years. This will be a spiritual practice that we'll, we'll really circle around as a church. I, again, am reinvigorated with the power of prayer. I shared the story of running into my friend. You can call it a coincidence or whatever, but I'm telling you, God hears us when we pray and he answers. He does. But sometimes we need to be more persistent. And when we're when we're faced with being persistent or quitting, we sometimes just quit. And why is that? It's because our patience runs thin. The Bible talks about patience being a byproduct, if you will, of the Spirit of God living in us. Paul uses, the Apostle Paul uses language like fruit of the Spirit. You guys heard of fruit of the Spirit? And one of the fruits, if you will, of the Spirit is patience. And sometimes when we're praying for something and we get impatient, we give up. But I'm telling you, when we're lacking patience in our lives, it is a gentle nudge from God himself by the Holy Spirit to remind us that we're living in a way that he does not have for us. I'm looking to all of the impatient people in the room right here because we all deal with it at some point. There are some days I'm incredibly patient. Like when I used to help my kids with homework all the time, I enjoyed it. It was great. Right, And then some days they would ask me, and it's like I would just blow up for no reason. Like I was in the middle of something, probably real important, like, I don't know, watching a football game. Anybody watch Ohio Notre Dame last night? Yeah. We're not sports people, I'm just asking. So, <laughs> but, we, but we become impatient, and, and, and I got real impatient. I've uh, been to the DMV a hundred times before, right? I don't recommend it at all, but I'm just telling you, I've been there. And I've, I've been there many times, and I've been patient before. I have, like, grace and compassion for all those people that work that terrible job, right? And then other times I've been there, and I've been so frustrated and impatient. Why? Because I, I don't know, I may have had other things going I don't know. But here's what I'm trying to say. Here's what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying it very well, so forgive me. <laughs> But sometimes when we're impatient, the Lord is saying, hello, something's going on in your life. Pay attention here. Something's happening. You're not living by the spirit right now. You're impatient. There's a whole other motivation inside of you, a little motivation engine. It's taking control, Jeff. Something's happening. You hear me what I'm saying? And so the lack of patience in our prayer is revealing to us that something's amiss. Jesus would say, continue, continue to pray, continue to pray. I could give more reasons. I'll give you one more as I close here, um, that oftentimes the things we're praying for are, in fact, not God's will. That's right. I said it. You want stuff that God doesn't want for you. Me too. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> and praise the Lord, he doesn't answer some of those sometimes, right? Right? Sometimes we're just praying against God's will, right? And, and we don't know that. So we, but Jesus is giving us an invitation. Just keep praying for it, bro. Just keep praying for it. Keep praying for it. Why? Because at some point, God just reveals it to us. Oh, I'm going the wrong way with this. And so if we just pray once and he doesn't do anything, we'll never know that we're actually asking for something that's outside of God's will. Is this tracking with anyone? 
Like I could go a whole list of these, but I won't. And, and actually two weeks, we're going to talk about what does it look like when God is silent in our prayers? We've got a whole list of things. to Why is God silent? Why is he on mute to us? But the, the point today is Jesus is asking us to persist in our prayers. Prayer is powerful. We don't have to be special. We don't have to be divine because we're not. We don't have to be special to pray. God listens to us because of what Jesus has done. The question for us is we must not give up in our prayers. Does anyone feel encouraged? I don't care. The, the Apostle Paul, I am. I'm encouraged. I'm telling you guys, it's awesome. You're going to get it. I, pr I prayed for you. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. The Apostle Paul uses this language in Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians. He says, to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Yes, use that language um, to be encouraged. Let me close with the story. It's not my story. It's not original to me. I'm just repeating it. But I want you to just put yourself in this place. You're traveling. Well, not you. A woman was traveling. Okay, I'm trying to tell you the story here. A woman was traveling, uh, Nashville or someplace, some faraway city, and she had a reunion with some family, family members or friends, a wedding, who knows what, it doesn't matter, but she gets all the way back home, no sooner gets off the uh, airplane, gets in her car, drives home, pulls into her driveway, right, from the airport, and realizes she left that really beautiful, expensive brooch that was her mom's and her mom's mom's brooch, you know what I'm talking about, that really expensive, pretty one, that's like an heirloom, she left it at the hotel, she pulls into the driveway, and she's just so frustrated. She's Not only is this thing super expensive, but its sentimental value is very high. If I lose this thing, I'll feel terrible. So she calls the hotel and says, listen, I was in room 123 or whatever. I, this is the color of the wallpaper. This is how the room was. The microwave's on the right. Like, she's explained to them, I know exactly where the brooch is. I left it right there on the table by the TV, by the remote. And she's talking to the manager, and the manager goes, can sense in her voice that this is a very important thing to her. He says, ma'am, 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 if you'll just wait a second, I'll put the phone down, and I'll go see if it's still there. What do you, what do you think the chances of it still being there are? Yeah, right. So he goes, and he finds it, and she's waiting on the phone, or he's looking for it, and she, he's, she's waiting on the phone. And after 30 minutes, like she's doing her laundry, she's unpacking her stuff. After 30 minutes, the manager never gets back on the phone, and she just hangs up. And unbeknownst to her, the manager had made it all the way to the room, got the brooch, was on his way back. He got held up with a, an employee asking some questions, had to help somebody else do something else. I don't know. He got, got busy. And before he got back to the phone to say, ma'am, you'll never believe I found your brooch, she had hung up. And she never got her brooch back. Okay, that's another parable. It's a make-believe story. But the idea is to just show you that sometimes we're asking God to do something and he's almost got it back to us, and we hang up. Jesus would want us to persist in our prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for our time together. Thank you that we love prayer, love Jesus, and that we know you listen to us when we pray. So God, would you remind us of the powerful um, effect that prayer can have in our lives? There are people here I know, God, have prayed for things, and they have forgotten them. And you, you wanted to answer those prayers, but they just, for whatever reason, have stopped. And so, Lord, we, we lean into that tension between your sovereignty and everything, that, that you're in charge of everything, but you, but you invite us to help shape history. And so we want to, to participate in that again. So, Lord, help us to to have strength to persist. Help us to believe that you're not mad at us and help us to believe that we don't need to be shameful when we come to you and say, Lord, you're right. I should have kept praying for that person so that they would know you. That I should keep praying for this or whatever. All these things, Lord, that there's an invitation to pray and we have given up, Lord, because we somehow believe that you're not listening. And so today I just pray that we would understand that that is not true, that you do hear us when we pray. That's what the psalmist says, that when the righteous pray, the Lord hears and he delivers them. And so God, give us the strength to persist in prayer. Give us the wisdom to know that we're praying for the right things. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. God, we want to give you praise today. 
We want to thank you for everything you've done. As we took communion this morning and we remembered all the things that you've done in our lives, those were, many of those things were answers to prayer. And so we just want to thank you for all of that, Lord. And sometimes those were answers to prayers that we didn't even pray, that, that people prayed on our behalf. Lord, I am here as a Christian because other people prayed for me. 100%. I was not seeking you, Lord, when I found you. That you were looking for me. I suspect because people were praying for me. So, Lord, I thank you for that. And I remember the work that you've done in my life. God, give us strength to persist. Give us the belief to know that when we pray, you're listening and you're doing things. Give us little bitty, like, like answers like I had last week, just remind us again and again that you're paying attention and you want to do things, Lord. Call them coincidences, call them whatever, Lord, but we need more encouragement. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Would you stand back to your feet as we go back to a few moments of just loving on Jesus and telling him how much we appreciate him? I love you guys. I hope to see you next week. God bless.